All right, AP Art History, we are in our final chapter of Content Area 2, Ancient Mediterranean, and we are going to round it up with the Romans now. Um, again, just trying to remember our enduring understandings and what uh, College Board wants you to understand about um, all of these areas is um, we're gonna be looking at another civilization that is grounded in civic ideas and polytheism. Um, we're going to also look at um, Roman art that um, is derived from uh, literary, political, economic records um, where we have you know, a, a expansion of the different forms and types of um, Roman art. And we have records now to um, show all of that history with us as well. So getting into some of that uh, Roman history, uh, these are just some, um, some major points to the Roman history, specifically during the era that we are going to be um, studying specifically the art, the Roman artwork. And it's very kind of um, prior to the Roman Empire. We, we dip into the Roman Empire a little bit, but then that's when we're going to transition um, and start to look at European art um, when we get into that Roman Empire and the fall of the Roman Empire and, and the Middle Ages. Um, but prior to that, we're going to be um, starting in about 750 BCE with Rome, the founding of Rome. Um, and then we're going to get into uh, a lot of art and architecture from the Roman Republic. And then, like I said, we'll just kind of dip into the Roman Empire a little bit. So what we know about Roman history is it started as a hillside village, um, a very small little village, but ultimately rose to power because of their diplomacy and their military. So the Romans are known for having a very strong military might. Um, the effects, though, of Roman culture are still felt today, um, very much like the Greeks. We have adopted a lot from the Romans through law, language, literature and fine arts. Um, there's a legend about um, the founding of Rome uh, by, the tw by twin brothers, Romulus and Remus, and that they're responsible for the founding of Rome. And we have a little video on the next slide that um, actually talks about that history a little bit. Um, but first, what we know is kings ruled Rome, uh, but eventually they were overthrown and then replaced by a Senate. And the Senate was full of very um, privileged men, although elected, um, still only a certain um, privileged you know, male could um, be part of the election process. Um, and that kind of gets into our Roman Republic a little bit. Um, we had lots of wartime um, during um, during Roman rule, and they were very, very well executed wars, which is why um, Rome was really successful in expanding their boundaries over the years. Um, in about 146 BCE, um, Rome absorbed Greece and really valued uh, Greek art and architecture, and um, there are a lot of their their laws and, and views on democracy and um, a lot of different um, arts and crafts like pottery and jewelry. And they, they just really had a lot of respect for Greece, so to speak, and, ad and adopted a lot of their cultural values. Um, they, of course, kind of morphed it and transformed it um, to be more distinct to the Romans, but you can tell that that Greek influence was a huge part of Roman development. Um, ultimately, then Rome began reproducing and um, copying Greek style, um, advancing a little, taking that classical style and um, kind of bringing it into a new display. Um, in the late Republic, the Civil War 
brought Octavian, who's otherwise known as Augustus Caesar, Caesar as empire in 27 BCE. And this is kind of that, that transition from the Roman Republic into that empire model. Um, and there was a succession of emperors that followed for the next 400 years. And that's where you get that, that great Roman empire, which continued um, to spread profusely. But like I said, in this um, chapter, we're really not going to get much into that part. Okay. Um, we're going to definitely, um, talk about Pompeii. Pompeii is the single most important archaeological site in the Roman world. Um, we know so much about Roman culture um, because of Pompeii, uh, reminding you that, that that volcanic ash is what preserved all of the artifacts that we have. Um, and that discovery of the city of Pompeii taught us so much about that culture. Um, and we're going to be seeing a lot of um, frescoes and artifacts that come straight from um, Pompeii for us to review. So this is um, the little video that I would love for you to watch about the founding of Rome and then just kind of the basic structure of Rome and, you know, how it developed from um, from a city into a, a republic and then kind of the start of the empire and then eventually how the empire split. It's um, short three minute video. Uh, it's packed full of um, important information that's going to help us with our timeline. It's also going to help us with the transition out of ancient Mediterranean and into um, early European art. And it will also tell the story of Romulus and Remus. So because um, unfortunately I'm unable to play a video inside of a screencast right now, um, I do ask that you go back to those Google Slides and play it for yourself so you can have this information in your graphic notes. All right, so I've broken down some of the Roman periods of art. Um, we have the Republican period, early imperial, late imperial, and late antique. So um, these are terms that you're going to be hearing when we're discussing artwork. Some um, cultural and contextual things that we do know about Romans and um, the Roman people is that they were a very wealthy group of people, very privileged. Um, they were known to spend lavishly on art and their homes. Um, they took great care in um, kind of decorating and being able to have the finer things in life. Um, Romans also had very elaborate social rituals, which included lifestyles to impress and entertain. Um, the arts were held in very high esteem. They were commissioned um, to the, and commissioned to be everyone, even in one's everywhere, even in one's home. So, what you're going to see now is that. Um, Commissioned artworks were not just for um, public spaces or, or sacred spaces or um, temples that we were now um, commissioning artists to bring um, frescoes and mosaics and sculptures into people's private homes. During ancient Roman times, artists were um, not treated well, though, even though they were appreciated for their skills, it was also something um, that they were expected to perform, um, that they were expected to um, perform their skills for the upper class. Um, they were looked at as, you know, more of a, a lower class citizen. Uh, that blue collar worker, so to speak, and they were expected to um, perform and create um, for the needs of the more privileged and more wealthy. So in this first screencast, we're really going to focus just on Roman painting. Um, and what we're going to be seeing here is uh, many interior frescoes. Um, frescoes was the um, painting that 
uh, was happening during these times. We are not looking at paintings that really occurred on paper or canvases um, that didn't really exist at this time. Fresco paintings were done on interior walls of um, homes and buildings, um, temples, any sort of arch um, um, architectural structure. And usually they would, um, frescoes would exist mostly in those rooms and in those areas that were windowless. And as we look at the types of frescoes that were created, you will probably understand why. Frescoes were commonly the subject matter of landscapes, mythological scenes, and city plazas. So um, between landscapes and city plazas, what we're looking at is, you know, a natural landscape of um, trees and, and mountains and, you know, outdoor scenic scenes. And then city plazas would be more architectural kind of urban city scenes. And then um, in addition to that, you would have some um, stories, some mythological stories that were definitely portrayed on frescoes. Mosaics were another type of, um, we can't necessarily call it Roman painting um, because it's not so much a painting, a mosaic is its own, um, is its own work of art, but they would decorate the floors, um, and not only were they there, you know, to in increase the beauty and the value and the splendor of um, a space, but they were also very economical in the sense that they kept the floors very, very cool in the hot summer months because, again, they're made of um, little pebbles of stones and glass that were embedded into the ground. And um, those materials would remain very cool on the feet and help cool the interiors um, during those hot um, summer months. Murals. We're going to see a lot of murals, but what you need to notice about Roman murals, Roman frescoes, Roman painting, um, if you take away anything from the Romans, is you are going to see the development of space. Space, not so much as a negative positive space, which is really kind of what we've focused on so far, especially when talking about sculpture. Um, but we are talking about space now in terms of two dimensional perspective. OK, so I have some examples here on the left. The types of perspective that we're going to be seeing here, one is called linear perspective. The other is atmospheric perspective. And then the third is foreshortening. We've kind of touched on the subject of foreshortening in the past, but here's a really great example of this figure on the top. This is called foreshortening. So it's when um, the, the figure or the object is put into such perspective of deep depth that um, the proportions technically are really kind of out of whack, but they need to be, they need to be in order to create that type of depth, right? So if we look at this figure and we notice his feet, okay, the size of his feet compared to the size of his head. I mean, they're almost like three times the size of his head. So we know realistically that, you know, somebody's foot should not be three times the size of someone's head. But in order to create the illusion of depth, the illusion that the feet are right here in the foreground and the person is way, you know, way there in the background, that we need to alter those proportions in order to give that illusion. That is called foreshortening. This middle example here, this is what is called atmospheric perspective. So what happens with atmospheric perspective is we know that when things are in the foreground, they're going to be kind of more crisp and more clear and more in focus. And as things recede into the background, they're going to be much hazier, much more like a foggy whisper. And when we see that, our brain is able to interpret that as depth, as perspective. So um, this is called atmospheric perspective. 
and you will see this technique utilized quite a bit. Um, down here, this is called linear perspective. Linear perspective is a little bit more mathematical um, because it is all about how um, the surrounding area, so here we have kind of like a, a train station, we have some buildings on the left, we have some um, telephone poles on the right, and then the train tracks in the center. And the concept is, is that um, all of these objects will go into the same, what's called a vanishing point. The vanishing point is your point on the horizon line. So you can see this horizontal line called the horizon line. And it's at that point that all of the objects will kind of disappear to. They will all come to that point. That is called linear perspective. And then everything follows those um, kind of diagonals and those lines that um, head toward the vanishing point. So you're going to see um, that being incorporated. And if you think about just leaving the Etruscans, for example, up into this point, we did not see a lot of perspective. We still saw things kind of flat in registers with, you know, ground lines. Um, we didn't see a lot of like um, layering in foreground, middle ground, and background. We would see some overlapping of figures, which, you know, helped with depth perspective. But at no point did we really see an entire scene of you know, some foreground images, some middle ground, and then some deep distant backgrounds. Um, so if you look at the paintings thus far, we're, we're taking a pretty big shift here. We're, we're really making a big leap bound in innovation. So taking all that information into account, this is our first um, image for painting. It's image number 39. It's called the Pentheus Room. And this room is within the House of Veti. And we will be looking at this um, House of Veti later on in our um, architectural part of the um, Roman content area. Um, but for now, we're just going to be looking at the House of Veti specifically for their fresco paintings. Um, this is from 62 to 79 CE. Like I said, it is a fresco. Understanding that a fresco is a painting that is painted um, onto the wall. And this is from Pompeii. So we have some very beautifully preserved um, paintings because of that volcanic ash. Um, so this room that we're looking at is a reception room that is off of the peristyle. Like I said, we're going to talk about the House of Vedi later as an architectural image, but just to help you a little bit, these are some images of the house. So we have, um, you know, this beautiful um, interior garden, and then around the garden, we have kind of the rooms. So if we take a quick look at this aerial perspective floor plan, this represents the um the garden okay then if you notice these dots that represents the columns right so those are the colonnade and then this is the peristyle around it and then here we have all of these uh rooms okay for the house of veti um so this um reception room is one of the rooms off of the peristyle and they're frescoes of allegorical paintings Allegorical is a term you're going to want to know, and really all that means in the art world is that it is um, it is a picture that tells a story. Okay, so it's it's an illustration, in other words. Okay, there are frescoes of um, interior architectural features and windows that display outside imaginary views. So this goes back to talking about Roman art and how oftentimes they, um, the frescoes were uh, in interior rooms that, you know, didn't have any sort of uh, natural light coming in. And 
with that being said, then what they would do to compensate for that is they would paint windows and architectural features. And so really that's what a lot of the painting was um, in this early Roman period was not so much um, paintings for the sake of painting, but really it was to continue um, the look of the, you know, architectural kind of quality. Instead of having just a blank wall, let's go ahead and paint windows. Let's go ahead and paint columns, um, paint wallpaper, and paint pictures as though they look like they're hung on the wall. Um, paint door frames and molding and all of these like architecturally elaborate things are now painted onto the wall, hence the term mural. Um, so that's really what we're dealing with during this early Roman art. Um, but because of that, we are looking at amazing displays and examples of perspective painting because they are painting on um, you know, architectural features, everything has to be in um, correct perspective. So if we look at this image over here in the Pentheus room, what we're looking at is these are windows that are painted and it looks as though you're peering out the window and you're seeing, um, you know, further architectural features outside, whether that be the neighbors or an extension of the actual building that you are inside of. Um, so we have, you know, those types of windows. And because we're looking at architecture, all of that has to be correctly into perspective or else it doesn't make sense. Um, we have columns that are painted. It's painted in perspective. So it almost looks like this is like an inset into the wall. Okay, like a little niche. Um, and then we have decorative paintings that look like the lower half of the wall is treated differently than the upper half of the wall. Um, so again, it's, 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 you know, almost this backdrop um, to an interior space that, you know, isn't really there. Okay. With that being said, um, there are four um, Pompeian styles of painting that relate to what we're talking about here. And um, I have some examples over here on the right hand side. So the first style of this Pompeian fresco painting is just about creating like a faux marble or a brick. Okay, so the first style is just, uh, here's an example up here, where instead of just having, you know, a plain wall, you go ahead and paint it so it looks like, you know, it's stacked brick or some sort of stone wall, okay? Um, the second style is all about creating a large um, mythological scene or landscape painted on walls with um, more architectural realism, okay? So, um, basically, these are going to be just very, very large allegorical scenes of mythological stories um, and then that's going to be the main part of it and then you'll have some more architectural realism that goes with it so like right here you know you're going to have a painting of some objects and then they're including some more architectural features so it looks like you know these objects are you know sitting on um, bricks or marble um, so it's kind of, you know, a, a bit of a combination, but actually it's more about these objects or these mythological scenes that um, just happen to be on a backdrop of um, architectural features, okay? But then the third style is like flip-flopped, okay? Where it's really more about huge architectural features, okay? A huge field of color, framed by all these architectural details and then you have some small little pictures and some small little scenes of you know allegorical stories or, or mythological stories okay 
Um, and so those are the, um, the different the three styles of Pompeian painting. And then the fourth style is just a combination of the first three. So, um, you know, it could be in any sort of ratio, but anything that combines all three of those elements would be considered the fourth style. So back to the painting um, in the Pentheus room, what we're looking at here is an entire room. All of the walls are treated with fresco. And this is a reception room that overlooked the garden um, at the House of Vetti, and it was decorated um, with, with a number of wall frescoes, but within the frescoes, there's three main paintings, and that's kind of what you need to focus on. I mean, you need to know where it's at in the House of Vetti. You need to know that there's, you know, architectural frescoes, but really they want, um, they do want you to focus on these three main paintings. Um, so what we have here is the fresco of um, Pentheus, who was a Greek hero. He is on the back wall, and this is the back, this is the painting of Pentheus. And what's happening here, this is a mythological story um, that Pentheus is, is literally being torn apart, torn to pieces, because he was in opposition of the cult of Bacchus um, within his city. He opposed this cult. And the women then of the cult who included his very own mother um, in their madness and frenzy at him uh, were responsible for literally tearing him apart piece by piece. So that again is a, it's a mythological story that is being depicted here on the back wall of the Pentheus reception room. Okay, so you'll need to know that, that mythological story that goes with it. The next um, screencast is going to be about sculpture. So for right now, um, we're going to pause. That's all you need to know for painting at this point. Like I said, we'll come back to the House of Eddie and we'll talk about it more, but as more of an architectural feature. The, um, the screencast on sculpture will be a little bit longer for we have much more items to go through. But Please try to, you know, take very special notes about all of those perspectives and the different Pompeian styles um, so that you can be uh, very well versed for the painting portion of Roman art.